Well, I'm invite you to turn in your copy of God's wonderful word, the scripture, to the gospel of Matthew. The gospel of Matthew. And uh, we're going to be in the 25th chapter today. And, and if you are a little unfamiliar where the gospel of Matthew may be and how to find that in your Bible, we want to help you out. We don't want anybody to feel distance. We want people to be able to have God's word in their hands and, and watch, follow along. So it's on page 880 in the Pew Bible that's there in front of, uh, in front of you if you're looking for it. And uh, we're going to be looking at the 24th chapter starting in the 32nd verse together in looking at God's Word. And we're continuing where we left off in the Olivet Discourse, this teaching, extended teaching that Jesus gave his disciples when they asked the pertinent question of when, when should we look for this great day of the Lord? When should we look for your, your absolute authority and, and sufficient rule and reign over all nations? When should we look for your ultimate redemption and your return? They want to know that, and Jesus spends time letting them know what they can know, what they should know, and trusting him in the middle of it. But as we prepare for this, I, I want you to know this is not just a pertinent question for them, and it's not just a question that's now come about today. It's a question of when that has absolutely got mankind in a tizzy for generations, and I mean centuries of generations. Here's a few, and I say few, here's some examples. As you know, in AD 500, there was a Roman clergyman that calculated that Jesus was going to return in AD 500. You know how he got that? His prediction was based on the dimensions of Noah's Ark. Obviously, Christ did not return at that time. In January 1st of the year 1000, many Christians in Europe, as you probably can picture, they predicted that the end was nigh. Sadly, some of these Christians, they even uh, were called and reacted to this millennial mark in a military fashion, beginning what we know as the Crusades, to try to take the world by force. And as the first year approached, some of these Christians' armies, they traveled to pagan countries throughout northern Europe and around the world to make converts by force so that Christ would be prepared have a place prepared for him when he returned. Guess what? At that time, Christ did not return. In the year 1450, a group called the Taborites were greatly influenced by the writings of a man named Joachim of Fiore, and that Christ would return once they shed the blood of his enemies, they defeated the persecutors, and so this group disbanded when they did not fare so well against a German army. And guess what? At that time, Christ did not return. During the Middle Ages, a pope named Innocent III took the number 618, the year that Islam was founded, and added the number 666, the number of the beast from Revelation, to get a astounding number of 1,284 and determined that that was the year of Christ's final return and judgment. Guess what? Christ did not return. In February 14th, ah, Valentine's Day, in the year 1835, Joseph Smith, the founder of the cult called the Church of the Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormons, called a meeting of his leaders. He announced that Jesus returned within 56 years. You can find this written and recorded in their History of the Church 2, 182, and earlier around the year one. 1832, Smith wrote in his Doctrines and Covenants, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God, and let it be written, the Son of Man will not come into the clouds until I am 85 years old. Christ would, I mean, excuse me, Smith would have been 85 in 1890. Yet, he was murdered by a mob before his 39th birthday. Guess what? Christ did not return. William Miller, the founder of a group uh, that was popular about the end times, uh, we have a division of their church even today, they bore the name Millerites and Millerism, and they predicted the second coming of Christ would occur sometime between 1843 and 1844. Well, this is the year 2024, so guess what? Christ did not return at that time. 
1874, Charles Taze Russell, the founder of what was the cult called the Bible Student Movement, which now has produced what we call the Jehovah's Witness, the Watchtower and Tract Society, and other organizations predicted the rapture of the church would happen in 1910, followed by the end of the world and Christ's invisible return in 1914. And guess what? Christ did not return. Well, at least according to them, no one saw him. In 1986, there was a group called the Children of God, and they predicted that Russia would defeat the United States and Israel, establishing a worldwide dictatorship, and then in 1993, Christ would return. Christ did not return. In 1988, Wise and not Edgar wrote the book 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is in 1988, and Colin Deal wrote Christ Returns by 1988. Those books sold over 4 million copies. Christ did not return. Lee Jang Rim of the church mission for the coming days prophesied that Jesus returned through the Sydney Harbor of Australia in October 28, 1992. 1992. Christ did not return. And sadly, neither did Rim as he walked away with $4.4 million. In 1998, a Taiwanese cult in Texas claimed that Christ would return and invite the faithful followers aboard a UFO. Christ did not return. And also in 1998, seems to be a good year. I graduated high school that year, so I don't know how that plays into it. But a good year for such prophecies as 666 times 3 equals 1998. So a psychic by the name of Edgar Cayce taught that a secret underground chamber would be discovered between the paws of the great sphinx in Egypt. And within that chamber would be documents about the history of the lost city of Atlantis, then this new revelation would activate the second coming of Christ. Christ did not return. Y2K. I'm not even going there. The list of prophecies is far too long. And each time, Christ did not return. Within my own lifetime, I've seen some of these. One of the most more recent came in the mid-2010s with Harold Camping, who in September of 94... It began to preach that the Lord would return. And then in, in his radio stations that he preached, his 55 radio stations and across 6,000 billboards nationwide, he wrote, Judgment Day is coming, May 21st, 2011. The Bible guarantees it. At that time, you could even sign up for the live Twitter feed End of world, May 21. I'm not really sure that's active anymore. But then after the date passed, without apology for his earlier false prediction, he then named October 21st, 2011 as the right date. All of this again with the same finality. Again, Christ had not returned. Now, all those sound somewhat strange, maybe even a little ridiculous to us. And yet there is this longing for some finality. There's this longing for some information and wisdom about the days to come that sometimes leaves us with just a simple hope, Christ is enough. May I be faithful to him and the service he is called until that day. But for others, there's a fretting of discomfort that leads them to go off skew and say, I'm looking to trust something else except the word of Christ alone. And that discomfort is not what our dear Lord, our Christ Jesus, intended. If he intended it, he would have not spoken anything about the end of days. Says, uh, he would probably have just said something like this, I am returning, you'll see it when you see it. And we would be left with a mystery, complete. But Jesus has given us direction so that when we look at his word, when we see what Christ teaches, Christ's followers will have Christ's comfort for Christ's return. And we're going to see that as we spend time in the word together, not merely talking about all the ways that people have got it wrong. Let's look at Jesus who tells us what is right. So, would you stand with me and honor God in the reading of his word? This is the Gospel of Matthew, the 24th chapter, starting in the 32nd verse. Please hear the word of our Lord. 
when he says this to his disciples and by virtue of the word to us. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its branches become tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words never will. Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding with a hand meal. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, be alert, since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and not left his house be broken into. This is why you are also to be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant for whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says in his heart, my master is delayed and starts to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, that servant's master will come on a day he does not expect him in an hour he does not know. He will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, holy are you and holy is your word. Just as you are perfect, and there is no error or conflict in you, so is what is given by your word to us. May we, today the sufficiency and inerrancy and infallibility of your word speak to us as your Holy Spirit illuminates what was presented and proclaimed. As we spend time understanding what these interpretations point us towards. God, as we seek to have that application of faith and practice in our lives today, all of this is only possible if you be with us. So God, that is our prayer. Be with us in the reading, in the application, in the practice of your word. Help me, Lord, to be faithful as a steward of it today so that people see you. For you are the one who is worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. So each week we have the same goal when we come to worship God. We want to make people see why God is worthy of worship. To understand how great this God is that, that is proclaimed through the word, through, through the Christian church, through, through his witnesses, how great he is. And the way that we do that is by going to the word. We have to say, all right, God has shown us who he is by speaking to us, by telling us. And so we must go to the place that tells us what he told us. And that is learning to see what he said in the word and I'm so thankful that that's the concentration of where we get our lessons, that it's our foundation. It's not me coming up with the latest and best or, or what's trendy or thoughts. Um, last night, you know, I was reminded that sometimes we forget about our process here at, as a church, or at least my process. Um, as your pastor, what I feel like I need to do is shepherding you. Uh, one of my children asked this, so what's your, why are you teaching on the end times like a couple Sundays in a row? What's, what's going on with that? And, and they weren't trying to mean anything by it. They were just curious, why now? Why here? And, and I said, well, it's because that's where we left off and that's where we're going. It's just, we've been studying the life of Jesus chronologically through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as they overlay one another. So these four eyewitness accounts of his life. And here we are on the Tuesday evening before the cross. 
of Jesus' life, and this just is what Jesus is teaching, so that's just what we're learning from. It's not that I just picked it up because it was the year 2024, or I look at election year, or any of that kind of stuff, or I want to scare some people, you know, get them right before they get left, or make them turn or burn. I'm not that person. We're just going where the direction of the Scripture takes us. And here we see what God has said which is important for us. It's never to be dismissed what God has said because what he says is always perfect and timely. But we also have trouble sometimes finding out what it means. We understand that during this discourse that was presented to give the disciples and us this overview of the events that would transpire within their time with the downfall of Israel in 70 AD, that the things that 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 generation saw that they didn't pass away before they saw the armies overtake it, but also giving us the view of the, the mountain ranges and the things that were ahead for that final day. We understand that many people have different interpretations about this. But as we've said over and over again, thoughtful Christians can disagree about the details and the uh, slight nuances about biblical prophecy But one thing that all true believers have in common is that they are unanimous to affirm that Jesus can be taken at his word, that he will return, and that it will be unmistakable, the world will behold it, but at the same time it will be unpredictable. And our job is to be spiritually ready to love and desire that that day of his appearing and to help others to be prepared. And so today as we read these words, it can sometimes shake us, it can sometimes confound us and confuse us, but more than anything, Jesus is giving his disciples an answer to that when question so that they will have comfort. And so as we think about how Christ's followers have Christ's comfort through Christ's teaching about Christ's return, Christ saturating it all, Christ being the source of it all, Christ being the direction and destination of it all, what comfort can be prized through Christ's teaching? Well, let's look at a few aspects of Christ's comfort here. First of all, we see Christ comforts solidly, uh, exceptionally and solidly, even in what is not known to us. Sometimes not knowing stuff, it bothers us. It, it makes us awkward. We, we feel like we're being left out and, and, and missing out. But know this, because of Christ, there may be things that you do not know, but it does not mean that Christ does not have control over it. It does not mean that Christ is solidly sovereign over it all. Think about it this way. There are aspects in our lives that we know as adults that sometimes our kids want to know why, and we could do our best to try to explain it, and they would still be left confused. But we, as their parents in that moment, who are assured that we are making the right decision, we know better than what they know. And the job and the goal of the child is to teach them, you can trust me, even though you may not understand in this moment what I tell you is for your good. That is a teaching that is profound throughout all of Christianity, not just just in relation to the end times but for our good in everything that jesus commands but how we know that christ comforts solidly even what is known what is not known to us is through his use for the word returning his arrival the parousia which is found in 24 39 42 43 44 46 50 25 10 19 and 25 he used this word to say look I'm using this word repetitively so you know without a question I'm talking about coming back. I didn't just give a one-off kind of offhanded statement so you misheard me. I said it repetitively so that you would know even though some things you do not know, this you do. I am returning. Now concerning when that time in history will be, Jesus says now concerning that day and hour no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. But what we can see is, however, the concern here for Jesus and for us is not the question of if, it's the concern of when. When. And that fixation that we can know this timing completely is a discomforting concern. There is an unhealthy fixation that will be discomforting to you, and that is to fret over when, when, when. But the concern that we need to hold true is not if. It's that it will happen. Now, some people have gotten caught up over this whole aspect before, and it's not just our generation. It's multiple generations. I want to know when 
And Jesus says, the angels don't know. And he says he doesn't know. Now, it should not surprise us. If it's something that the angels don't know about that precise date, then it should not confound us that we don't know. Like, they're, they're up there. They're, they're doing the Father's will. They're about the Father's plans perfectly in eternity. We're here with all our foibles, all our frailties, and they don't know. But the fact that Jesus doesn't know, that, that really bothers some people. And how to best explain it for our comfort so that we can have assurance that it's not a question of if, it is the concern of when, and that when is going to happen. Daniel Durrani writes this about the concern of why Jesus doesn't know or how that we seem to be missing out on something. He says, remember that Jesus chose to limit his divine powers when he became man. God, as we know him, is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, meaning all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. Jesus possessed these powers, but chose not to exercise them at most points in his ministry. For Jesus is omnipresent, yet he traveled from place to place by foot, typically, or by a boat and donkey occasionally. When Jesus wanted to go to Jerusalem, he walked. He didn't stand in Capernaum and tell the disciples, since I'm omnipresent, I am already in Jerusalem, so I'll stay here and I'll see you when you get there. When he walked, he laid aside his omnipresence. Jesus is omnipotent, all-powerful, yet unless he ate food, he became hungry. And without sleep, he became tired. Eventually he slept, and sometimes he slept hard, even in the middle of storms. He did not draw on his omnipotence to fill his empty stomach or to refresh his weary body. Jesus is also omniscient, yet he laid aside his knowledge too. Jesus would ask genuine questions in the Gospels. In Mark, he were told, who touched me? And he looked around to see who it might be. In Mark 19, 9, 16, he said, what are you arguing about? In John 5, 6, he asked a man how long he had been sick. And on other occasions, he asked visitors, what do you want me to do for you? Indeed, if Jesus had constantly exercised his divine attributes, he would not have led a divine, a genuine human life. If he had endured no human limitations, his incarnation was a charade. If the crucifixion caused Jesus no pain, how could he suffer for us? If no bodily desires touched him, how can we say in every respect he was tempted as we are? So Jesus truly did not know when he would return at this point. He did not need to know, nor do we. He finished his work so he is ready to return. And Christians who balk at the implications of this verse They reflect what's called docetism, the early Christian heresy that did not accept the full humanity of Jesus. And it lacked the the full appreciation for the extent that God would condescend to the earth in the incarnation and that would take various limitations upon himself. They would not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. This is what we have that solidly comforts us. That Christ chose to reveal that there would be a when. And that day would be coming. It's never a question of if. But we are not left with fixation upon what we do not know. For that brings us discomfort. Secondly, Christ comforts surely in what is known to us. If what is not known to us and Christ comforts us even there, then surely what he gives us is of immense comfort. Surely information helps clarify certain things. And so what is known to us concerning that day? What did Jesus tell us in this Olivet Discourse, in this this conversation with his disciples? What did he want them to know? Well, some of this is going to be taking back to the last two days. But we know these things are concerning that day, the day that was looking beyond the destruction of Israel, uh, of Jerusalem, the day that was looking to the fulfillment of all things. This is what we know certainly about that day. Surely that day will be clear. That day will be clear. Jesus' will turn will be as obvious as lightning flashing from one end of the sky to the others. It will be obvious, as he said, as a group of vultures gathering around something dead. You know, you kind of see the vultures like, well, something died out there. We are told that Jesus is going to return in such great glory that all the tribes of the earth, all the peoples of the earth will see him. In fact, they'll pound their chest. They'll mourn at his returning because so many will be not ready. The Lord gives illustrations of of a trumpet call. Not only will it be seen by those who have eyes, but there will be a trumpet that 
mixes our sense of sight with our sense of hearing. And he uses this sense to declare that when his return comes, it will be so clear and obvious that it will affect our, all of our faculties. In other words, the return of Christ, according to Jesus, what we do know and surely hold will be loud, it will be public, It'll be worldwide. It'll be personal and and felt. It'll be visible. In other words, it will be clear. It will be obvious. What else do we surely know that comforts us? In other words, whenever people see that, they'll start thinking, you know, those people weren't kidding. That Jesus they talked about, he did what he promised. So take heart in that, that it's clear. Give comfort in that. But next, it'll be overwhelming. If I, as if all this weren't enough, we see the astounding aspect of Jesus' return. The text that Jesus brings shows us that what we can know about his awesomeness. That's a small word for how big he is. It's overflowing with his power and glory. In verse 29, he tells us he's going to appear with heavenly light show, a, a display of cosmic turnaround. It'll make the 4th of July and everything that we complain about on Memorial Day weekends when people put on their their, uh, online social profiles, when are people going to stop firing fireworks? It'll make all that look like puniness in comparison. As one writer put it, it'll make Haley's Comet look like two Boy Scouts rubbing sticks together to get a spark. This is how awesome will be the display in the heavens. It'll be felt overwhelmingly felt all the tribes the clouds of heaven the power and great glory everyone will see his arrival his appearing his parousia as the everlasting ruler shows his face in our earthly dominion verse 31 jesus says he'll display his absolute authority because he is the one that will send out his angels he is the one that will gather his elect it will be his people The whole world will be displayed as in his hand from one end of the heavens to the other. J.C. Ryle, a a bishop uh, in England, we don't have bishops because we don't believe in that, but he was a famed preacher in England about the same time as Charles Spurgeon. He wrote this about the difference between Jesus' first arrival and his second arrival. Many people have talked about that in the first time he came in a a manger and the next time he will come as as the Messiah ruler and, and all these things. But this is what he writes. It says, the second personal coming of Christ will be as different as possible from the first. He came the first time as a man of sorrows familiar with suffering. He was born in the manger of Bethlehem in lowliness and humiliation. He took the very nature of a servant and was despised and not esteemed. He was betrayed into the hands of wicked men. He was condemned by an unjust judgment, mocked, flogged, crowned with thorns, and at last crucified between two thieves. He will come the second time as the king of all the earth with royal majesty. The princes and the great men of this world will themselves stand before his throne to receive an eternal sentence. Before him every knee, every mouth will be, shall be silenced, every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. This is how awesome that day will be. Surely the fact that it is clear and that it is overwhelming brings us comfort that his return will be good and glorious. The day of the Lord will also be unexpected. This is the part of the warning that Jesus gives, and it's meant to leave us with comfort that we would be prepared. We would long for his appearing. But in verses 37 through 44, we see this message that the servant's master will come on a day that he did not expect him and an hour he does not. Verse 44 talks about as the illustration of the days of Noah and the two men and the women. It says, this is why you are to be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And may it never be said of us that we live in such a lackadaisical, apathetic manner that we're not at least prepared. That we as a church would not have the indictment placed upon us unexpectedly. For God has given us his word so that we can be prepared and we can tell generations until that day, whether it be today, tomorrow, or 10,000 years, we must be ready. For we do not know when he will return, but we know he will return. This is what gives the Christian, the Christ follower, comfort in what we do know. 
We may not understand everything, but this we can remember. He will come and it will be clear. It will be overwhelming and it will be unexpected for many. What will we do in light of that in following Jesus? Thirdly, Christ comforts instructively. He gives us directions in what the wise person should do. As we look at this, we see this, this theme of unexpected carrying us forward in, in, in quite a few illustrations. Jesus gives four of them. He takes people back to the biblical flood about the days of Noah. He takes people to both men and women who are working. He takes people to the homeowner who faced a thief in the night. And he talks about two servants or two types of servants. Some believe it's two different servants. Some believe it's just one person and, and going one of two ways. But the point of all of these is, is not just to say, oh, the world's in trouble because they will be unexpected. But it's meant to stir up unbelievers to faith. And it's meant to push and encourage believers to expectancy. In other words, for us to be awake, to be alert, to be ready, to be wise. I mean, if someone gives you a lot of facts, if they tell you what's what, and then whenever everything gets shook up and, and, and it's brought to confrontation, who's to blame? Who, who is left to blame? If someone is faithful and you, you've been given the information, then what is left is, what is the wise thing to do? Well, to act upon what has been given, to act upon what has been revealed, what is known. So what then does the wise person do? Well, first of all, we see the wise person believes in Jesus. They believe Jesus. They trust him. They take him at his word. And make no mistake, this is not just trying to be wise and to be smarter and to be a little bit better and self-improvement. This is the gospel imperative that if you get this wrong, you get the whole thing wrong. It's the gospel imperative because it's not just you trying to dot your I's and cross your T's and get everything in a chart filled out so that you have somehow put Jesus in a box or got the loopholes on Jesus that you have the reason to, to have a get out of jail free card. No, it's the place where you understand we have no plea except for our plea in Jesus. We have no person who is our righteousness except for the righteousness of Jesus. We have no one who does good on our account except for the goodness done by Jesus. We have no substitute for the penalty of death except for Jesus who willingly gave up his life. We have no sacrifice able to meet the debt of our sin except for the eternal sacrifice that was given by Jesus. And if we have not come to the place where we have stopped trying to figure it out, to say, okay, I've got to, I want to keep living my own way, and I want just a little bit of touch of Jesus here and there to make me feel good about why I'm living my own way, and instead saying, Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner, and I fall short of your glory. And there's no way that I'm figuring this out on my own. There's no way I'm going to work myself out of this. There's no way that anything on my side can outweigh the scales. But I admit I'm a sinner, but I also believe you're the Savior. Not because I'm clever, not because I'm better than anybody else, but because your word says you are who I need. I have nowhere else to go. So in my admitted sinners, I believe you're a Savior, and I confess that you are the Lord who is able to forgive me of my sins. So I plead for what you alone can give, and the Bible says the person that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the gospel imperative. It does not matter what a person does unless that person has first placed his trust in Jesus for his peace, for his righteousness, for his salvation. Because all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God without that. And the wages of that are death. The wise person also does good. Because they believe in Jesus, take him his word, they see that their goal is to be, do good and not evil. Not to continue doing the things that Jesus saved us from. You know, thank you for saving me from the crocodiles, but I really just want to keep swimming with them. And does it make any sense? And so they seek to do good by staying awake, by being ready. But this is more than just having attentiveness and saying, all right, I need to keep my eyes open. It's having the actions that says, I am willing to live faithfully. John Calvin, one of the famous reformers, when he was getting older, because we all do that, people started telling him, maybe you should take a little time off. He was a just incredible, prolific author. Wrote, 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 wrote so much. 
And he says, you know, you've done such good. Why don't you just step back? This would be the modern day equivalence of us saying, you know, you've done your time. Or us saying to ourselves, I've done my time. To which I always like to say, when did following Jesus become a sentence? All of us still have work to do. But John Calvin's rebuttal in the midst of this, when asked to just be ready to ride off into the sunset, would you have my master find me idle? Would you have my master found me idle? You see, in John Calvin, he took seriously what Jesus said. To believe what Jesus said, take him as word, and to do good and not evil. For he knew judgment was coming. Eventually, the reckoning for the world, he believed God's word, and he says, I, I better do what God says. I better be at work. So this is what the wise person does. The wise person also does good works in the light of salvation. Jesus is not just talking about being industrial and just staying busy. He's talking about being faithful. He gives these illustrations involving people who don't listen, who don't care, but are working. They are working. They're people busy working, grinding at the mill. They're people entertaining and welcoming people at banquets. They're eating and drinking. Uh, some of them are whining and dining. They're thinking that Christian witness who proclaim repent and judgment is coming. They sound like crazy people. Like some old guy building a boat in the middle of a desert for a hundred years. This is what they do. But the wise person does these good works not in the light of public approval. Not in the light of gaining a step in the world. But in light of salvation, what Jesus saved us from. And what Jesus is able to save others from. The wise person also listens and lives in the invisible presence. Even in the invisible presence of their master. That last illustration that's given, the one of the wicked servant, is someone who does listen. He thinks his master will return, but he thinks he has time to live, even lawlessly. He thinks he's his own master. You see that in the way he lords over others, and he loves himself. That's why he says... My master is delayed. He's not coming back anytime soon. My master is out of sight and thus out of mind. So what does he do? Well, Jesus says he doesn't do anything good. He begins to beat his fellow servants. It's pretty rough. He eats and drinks with drunkards. That's not very righteous. In other words, what you see in this man is a condemnation of not a wise person, but a person that holds to a message of cheap grace. They don't even really believe in grace, and if they do, they cheapened it. They think God is not looking, that he is not Lord, and that Jesus is not coming, so he just keeps on sinning. Jesus gives all of this so that we would be comforted in knowing what we're to be doing if we're wise. One don't be caught unaware. And I'm just going to put this out here. Today you're here hearing this message. You cannot go unless you've absolutely tuned out to every single word saying I've gone uninformed. Jesus says do not be caught unaware. And to understand, it says that he will cut him into pieces and assign him a place to the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of tents, not teeth. As one person put it this way, it seems indifference to what Jesus adamantly told us. Indifference is a damnable offense. Unless someone hears what Jesus says, sees the kindness that he extends and knows that he is coming and they repent and believe. And I hate to say this. I really do. What breaks my heart about a lot of this Most of this message will be lost not on those outside the church. It'll be lost on those inside it. You see, we need to understand that the nominal, just coming when they feel like it, coming when it feels good, church goer, church doer, 
The sad thing is they can be the most deaf to the call of Christ. It says this person was in his master's household. He was actually even put in charge of stuff by his master. And yet his indifference is what led to his demise. Jesus is not asking for nominal churchgoers or church doers just to put on the pretense. He's asking for all, all to heed the call to receive the comfort that he alone provides to be restored. And you may think, well, yeah, but it's under threat. Well, judgment is not a dirty word. If it was, you would never use it in your house. Go sit in the corner. You're going to get a spanking. You're going to be in time out. I'm going to take away that device. It's, I bought it for you. I will take it away. If we thought judgment is a dirty word, then don't you dare use it in your home. If you thought judgment is a dirty word, don't hold anybody to account in your office, on the work floor. If you think judgment is a word, then, then why do we even have a sense of law? It's not. It's a speaking to the righteous standard of God that is placed and seen in glimpses throughout our world. But it's an accountable word. It's a holy word. It's a good word. It's a word from Jesus, so it's a great word. It's a loving word. For the wise person, they believe in Jesus. They take him at his word. The wise person does good and not evil. And the wise person thinks and feels and acts those ways because the wise person believes that Jesus really is coming and he will judge the living and the dead. He will be the righteous standard. Lastly, Jesus comforts prophetically in what the wise person should remember. Not just what the wise person should do, but the wise person should remember. What seems so sadly ignored in churches today, even in our circles, is that the last things should be first. In other words, everything we do is a means to an end. And if what we do in those means doesn't reflect that there's an end, then we need to reevaluate the means. We need to really reconsider what the end looks like. And it's because Jesus spoke of a coming, culminating day, a fulfillment day. We need to understand that. We talk about this in the gospel that everybody knows that one day a day of death is coming and that you should think about that day because there's a day beyond it. But when it comes to living our life as witnesses faithfully, we also need to consider that day as we live these days. This is what is of first importance in light of the gospel. We don't know when Jesus returned. However, we can know for certain that he will. David Platt writes, Christ's second coming should be in our minds, on our minds, in our hearts, not in such a way that we stop everything we're doing and sit still, but in such a way that it affects everything we're doing. Our thinking about him is not forced. It's a result of love. It's a result of his comfort. Martin Luther, the reformer, says Christians should live as if Jesus had died this morning, risen this afternoon, and was coming this evening. He was often says, I only worry about two days, this day and that day. And because I think upon that day, it helps me live this day. So we must consider this as Jesus has prophetically declared, this is what you to remember. There is an end. How does it affect your means? As Christ followers, this is what it should look like. We should be those that confidently watch because we know this will happen. As Christ followers, we should be patiently waiting because it should be something we long for. As Christ followers, we should urgently work because we know there is work to be done that's entrusted to us. As Christ followers, we should faithfully witness, letting those who do not know know what they do not know. And while keeping that in remembrance, understanding his delay will be long, we've been waiting 2,000 years. If God decides to delay another 10,000, that's his prerogative. If his delay is long, it doesn't mean it's wrong. In fact, I'm glad that for many reasons that there is a lengthier delay. Peter puts it this way. The Lord's delay is not slow as some think slow. For a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years a day. And God is not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance. The fact that he delays is a testimony that he is longing to see those who are sinners restored as his children. 
But understand that even though the delay is long, his return will be sudden. So don't be passive. Understand that his judgment for those left without Christ will be irrevocable. So may we be, as we close, a bit like Jonathan Edwards, American Great Awakening pastor. In his resolutions, he wrote this about his life. Resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if I expected it would not be above an hour before I should hear the last trumpet. Resolved to inquire every night as I'm going to bed wherein I have been negligent, what sin I have committed, and wherein I have denied myself. Also at the end of every week, month, and year. Resolved to ask myself at the end of every day, week, and month, and year, wherein I could possibly, in any respect, have done better. Resolved, I will act so as I think I shall judge would have been best and most prudent when I come into the future world. Resolved, to endeavor to my utmost to act as I can, I can think I should do. And if I had already seen the happiness of heaven and hell torments. So here's the crucial questions as we close. Are you... Am I keeping watch for Christ? Am I, am, are you faithfully following him? Am I, are you trusting him? Am I, are you serving him through what he's been given to you and I? For this is the question that should result and be produced out of the gospel. And if Christ brings us comfort, may the answer be yes.